So good evening, ladies and gentlemen, on this autumn day of November 3rd, 2021. On behalf of the Hellenic Society Prometheus and its board, I welcome you to this gathering as part of our event series. We are delighted to have with us tonight Professor Nasus Papalexandru, Associate Professor at the Department of Art and Art History at the University of Texas at Austin. Professor Papalexandru received his PhD from Princeton University, focusing on the ritual dimensions of early Greek figurative art. Prior to teaching at the University of Texas at Austin, he taught at the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor and spent the 2001-2002 academic year as a research fellow at the Center for Hellenic Studies here in Washington, DC. More recently, he has held fellowships at the Center of Advanced Studies in the Visual Arts at the National Gallery in Washington, DC, and at the American School of Classical Studies at Athens in Greece. He has published numerous articles in scholarly journals. His first book titled The Visual Poetics of Power, Warriors, Youths, and Tripods in Early Greece was published in 2005. He has just completed his second book titled Bronze Monsters and the Cultures of Wonder, Griffin Cauldrons in the Pre-Classical Mediterranean, which is being released this month as we speak, published by University of Texas Press. Other ongoing projects include the publication of early Iron Age bronze finds from the sanctuary of Etonia Athena in Thessaly, Greece, and the collecting practices of Greek geometric art after World War II. Tonight, Professor Papalexandru will be talking about his research on Greek antiquities exchanged as diplomatic gifts between the Greece and the United States of America after World War II. After the presentation, we will dedicate some time for questions and answers. So I invite you to post your questions in the chat section of the Zoom. And please start posting them as soon as you have a question or thought during the presentation and the Q&A. This way we'll be able to sort them. It is a pleasure to have you with us, Professor Papalexandru. Welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this very kind introduction. I just want to make sure that everybody can hear me very clearly, I hope. Um, I'm honored to be invited and I'm excited because I've been working on this topic for a long time. I had to put it on the back burner during the pandemic, mainly because what I do involves lots of archival research and archival research or lots of uh, in-person research was not possible during the, the last two years. So gradually now I'm re-entering this topic. So I feel very galvanized and energized starting to think about it again, to ask new questions or revisiting old ones through uh, a new lens. Uh, a special thanks to Zoe and Mrs. Katarji and Adonis for, for assisting uh, with this presentation for the organization. It's wonderful also for me to address a special audience with a special empathy and understanding um, of this topic. So I look very forward to your questions and responses. I want to start with a reminder of one of the most, um, of the oldest sayings in Greek culture. Fovutus Danaus Kedora Ferodas. Beware of Greeks, especially when they bring presents. Uh, diplomatic gift giving is as old as history. Uh, in a certain way, we may think of Greek history starting with the Trojan War, the resolution of which involved an item, the Trojan horse, Durios Ipos, which may be thought very easily and appropriately as a diplomatic gift. Uh, it would take me an entire semester of lectures to unfold the history of uh, gift exchange in politics, uh, both in Greece and worldwide. We're talking here about a universal practice. Uh, so I'm going to be very, very focused today and I'm going to be talking about Greek antiquities, 
which were exchanged as diplomatic gifts after a world war between, um, in most cases, uh, Greek political delegations that arrived uh, in Washington, D.C. in order to negotiate with presidents or with high-standing officials. This practice continues to this very day. And I can't help sharing with you this very um, recent case of a Russian icon of Saint Nicholas and Spiridon, which was donated by President uh, Vladimir Putin to the then president of the Hellenic government, Mr. Alexis Tsipras, during his visit uh, to Moscow in um, April of 2015. This is a very, very interesting opener to what I examine. Of course, this is a Russian gesture rather than a Greek gesture, but the diplomatic gift is what interests here. A, Greek, a Russian Orthodox prime minister giving a highly private devotional uh, object to a declared atheist prime minister of Greece. Uh, but what mattered was uh, the impressions and the overtones about the, um, uh, the depth of ties connecting Russia and Greece uh, throughout history, and especially at this very special moment. Um, in the United States, protocol dictates that foreign dignitaries politicians, diplomats who arrive in Washington, they come loaded with significant objects that they present to presidents or high standing officials with which they work together um, pursuing their interests. I show here a snapshot from uh, the Clinton Library and Museum in Little Rock Arkansas, which shows just a small percentage of the type of items that presidents receive. And they receive this item not as personal gifts, but on behalf of uh, the people of the United States. This is why I, it is very difficult for, for uh, presidents when they step down to take these objects to their uh, personal dwellings. They have to make them available to the people. And this is why, uh, if you guys are familiar with presidential libraries and museums, when you visit them, there is always a section that functions like a veritable museum in which these gestures of honor and mutual understanding are materialized in the form of significant objects of art or cultural objects. And here, uh, what interests what interests are is this icon, this orthodox icon. And also I point your attention to the item that adorned the poster for this presentation. I will have to say a few more words later on, but you get the point. Objects in political relations are very, very significant. And those of you, those of you who follow um, current news, you may remember a recent article in uh, um, the New York Times a few weeks ago, uh, reporting about President Trump getting in trouble about the mode of his reception from very, very glitzy presents originating in Saudi Arabia and places like this. Uh, and you may remember even more recently, just three days ago, President Biden was in the Vatican uh, visiting the Pope and the Pope and President uh, Biden exchanged gifts and these gifts were commented upon by the media mainly because they were significant. They registered several layers of symbolism and messages. Um, close to home, I'm very happy uh, to have an office at the campus of the University of Texas at Austin a hop, skip, and a jump, a stone throw away from the LBJ library and museum. And I just show a snapshot that is very characteristic of the type of objects uh, exchange, um, the types of diplomatic presence I focus on. Very often their antiquities 
epitomizing the best of the best of values, cultural values and history that uh, those who give the objects want to signal to the recipients. And here I take you to um, Abilene, Kansas, the presidential library and museum of President Eisenhower. I point your attention to very fine China, to other significant objects that he received during his long presidency in the 50s. And you may be able to notice here a Corinthian helmet, a bronze Corinthian helmet that the president received in 1952. Not only presidents, but their wives received receive um, gifts, um, mostly jewelry, sometimes very expensive jewelry, or jewelry crafted for the special occasion of the visit. The ladies, the wives of presidents, exchange uh, presents. Uh, uh, not so much because they want to do that, but because protocol, ethimotipia in Greece dictates that. Um, sometimes the gifts take very, very peculiar forms. During my research, I was very amused to discover what happened when uh, Eleftherios Venizelos around 1930 visited Ankara uh, as a guest of Kemal Ataturk. I have not been able to find a record of what he presented, what gift he brought for Kemal Ataturk, but you would not imagine how Kemal reciprocated. He essentially gave to Eleftherios Venizelos an Ankara cat. Kemal was very fond of Ankara cat and the little Cat, the little feline, ended up uh, her days in the mansion of Eleftherios Venizelos in Athens. During my research, I also discovered uh, that uh, President Eisenhower, during his farewell trip in uh, 1959, stopped in Tunisia. Tunisia back then had a king, and the king decided to donate to the president an Arabian horse and two gazelles. The Arabian horse was because uh, President Eisenhower was very fond of horses and the two gazelles because he had a reputation as a hunter. As you understand, and as it becomes evident from archival documents, uh, the, the, the state apparatus handling these matters was in havoc. They did not know what to do with either the horse or the two gazelles. And resolving that uh, took several months. So four months later, in March 1960, this declassified uh, message, a telegram from Germany to the White House, reports uh, presidential gifts, excuse me, airlift of Arabian horse and two gazelles from Tunis to Hanover, Germany completed. Animals reportedly in good condition. And I believe the animals happily ended up in Kansas after President Eisenhower's uh, retirement and, and they ended up their lives there very, very happily. Now, the project. I'm going to present in very broad outlines my project, and then I will have a few words to say about a very special case, the delegation which inaugurated the practice of Greeks bringing antiquities as presidential gifts to Washington, mainly for presentation to US presidents. What is my project? My project involves tracing the history of antiquities as presidential gifts. And so far I have managed to find out that we don't have pre-World War II recorded instances. But after World War II, the practice seems to be taking shape in 1946. And this is perhaps not accidental. And I show here an amphora from a shipwreck that was presented to Ambassador McVie in Greece by the mayor 
of the city council of Nikia in October 1946. Unfortunately, I don't have um, time to unpack this gesture, but you get the idea. It is very, very significant. I show here a snapshot of the delegation that will keep us busy in a few minutes. The practice continues as we have already seen uh, in 1953, in um, the 7th of May of 1953, Prime uh, Minister of Coordination, Spiros Marquezinis in the middle was able to have a meeting, a significant meeting with President Eisenhower who is here shown handling the bronze Corinthian helmet that a few minutes ago we witnessed in the display case in Abilene, Kansas. In his farewell trip to Greece, the then kings and queen of Greece gave Eisenhower a royal welcome. And on this occasion, he received two significant objects that um, are part of the Smithsonian Institution collections nowadays. One is a red figure Peliki, a wonderful vase that shows two hunters uh, performing hunting exercises. And the other is a very graceful marble head of a little girl, um, uh, probably deriving from a standing figure, uh, the like of which was um, um, uh, manufactured um, in the fourth century BCE. During the same visit, President Eisenhower uh, was honored with the Golden Medal of Athens, and he also received a black figure Lykithos that you see on the left-hand side. We move on in time, and the practice has taken very, very deep roots. President Karamanlis, you are all familiar with President Karamanlis, uh, in uh, 1961 visited himself newly elected, visited the newly elected President Kennedy and his vice president shown here on the picture in order to discuss expansion of trade relations and especially American investment in Greece. And he came loaded with antiquities, perhaps not of the glitzy, attractive uh, kind uh, Eisenhower and President Truman had received, but very significant. Karaman Lees brought for Kennedy a transport amphora, a wine transport amphora seen on the upper left, and a table amphora, a medieval table amphora seen on the lower left. Perhaps because the theme of the delegation was trade and the exchange of economic goods. He, they also brought a very, very unusual object for uh, Jackie Kennedy, uh, which I'm right now in the process of investigating. So I, I, I will leave it for a future presentation. In 1967, the then um, King Constantine came to the White House for lunch and he came loaded with a wonderful black figure, Helix or stamped cup, a wine, a wine uh, drinking vessel of the ancients that you see here, a, a, a close up. It's, it's literally stored a hop, a skip and a jump from my office at the University of Texas at Austin. In 1967, again, Margaret Papandreou, the wife of the late Andreas Papandreou, met um, President Johnson in, an, in a reception at the Greek Embassy in Washington, DC. And on behalf of her husband, presented to him this nice little uh, fragment of a grave relief that you see on the screen. Lyndon B. Johnson received many antiquities, not only from Greece, but from all over the world. And I show here um, how they are um, on display in, in a special uh, section of the LBJ, the Presidential LBJ Library and Museum here in Austin, Texas. After the fall of the junta in 1976, 
President Karamanlis made it a habit of systematically presenting antiquities as gifts to politicians, dignitaries, heads of state. Karamanlis in and of itself and his gestures could be a book in of, of its own. Uh, but I show here two wonderful Boeotian terracottas that uh, he presented to Senator Ted Kennedy in um, uh, the 8th of November of 1976. Uh, we move on about two decades later in 1994, uh, Andreas Papandreou presented to President Clinton this icon of circa 700 AD. Uh, we know that the estimated value of the icon is $3,000. And we know this because US law dictates that all public employees declare what they receive, the value of what they receive, and what uh, the value of what they receive and why they receive it. There is a publication by the Department of State, um, and I show here an excerpt uh, titled The Federal Register, in which we see we have um, in a systematic uh, mode the presentation of uh, the name and title of person accepting the gift, the nature of the gift, the identity of the giver, and the circumstances justifying acceptance. And usually this is that non-acceptance would cause embarrassment to donor and US government. So protocol dictates that gifts have to be received. When they are received, it is a political gesture and it carries consequences, also significance. And as you see here under the, the column that presents the nature of the gifts, there is always an um, estimate of its monetary value. It is imperative that the public employees are very clear about the mon monetary value of what they receive. And I show here the entry of the, for, for the icon um, titled Coronation of the Virgin uh, and Throne, the date, um, the technique, et cetera, et cetera, by His Excellency Andreas Papandreou, non-acceptance would cause embarrassment to donor and US government. I could go on and on and on and on. I show here the little um, um, pot. It's a Beosian uh, pixies of about the middle of the sixth century BC. It was a gift of uh, Thodoros Pangalos, then Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, during an official trip to Washington, D.C., to President Clinton. And now, as we saw again in the beginning, this nice little graceful, unassuming pot uh, is part of the collection at Little Rock in the Presidential Library and Museum. Um, during my archival research in Greece, I was able to find lots of documentation, um, especially documents authorizing um, the export, the legal export of antiquities. Um, sometimes these antiquities derive from the art market of Greece, a practice that is now defunct. Sometimes they derive from collections of museums in which uh, certain types of antiquities exist as duplicates and the museum authorities decide that they can spare them mainly because the cost justifies the exportation of antiquities. And I remind all of you how sensitive the, um, the Greek authorities and the Greek people are when it comes to the uh, exportation of antiquities from the home country. And this makes sense considering how much Greece has suffered, Greece and its has, cultural heritage has suffered from the illegal digging and exportation of its antiquities outside borders of Greece. My research questions and goals. I'm trying to shape a complete corpus of artifacts 
to the extent that this is possible. I try to understand this corpus um, vis-a-vis the wider universal practice of antiquities used as diplomatic gifts. I'm interested in these objects as archeological artifacts. I'm interested in exploring the provenience and the provenance of these artifacts. This is very, very important for me. Provenience uh, is essentially the circumstances of uh, discovery in the archeological context of these antiquities, if they exist. Provenance, on the other hand, is the history of um, collecting of these artifacts, the history of ownership of these artifacts. Um, I'm interested in exploring the mechanisms underlying the practice. Who selects these objects? Who decides that they are appropriate as diplomatic gifts? How these processes take place and why? What is the legal framework in Greece? Who stages the very highly orchestrated circumstances and ceremonies of gift exchange? We saw pictures with President Eisenhower and President Truman, these pictures are not just casual snapshots. They are all very, very theatrically, I would say, stage. There is lots of theatrics in all these, um, in all in, in, in the presentations, mainly because gifts carry significance, not only political or cultural. They punctuate a moment, an electrifying moment of exchange. They are memorable and the public are interested in them. Finally, I want to reflect on the value, either pragmatic, social, or symbolic, uh, generated by the artifacts that punctuate this political relationship, the, precisely the, the artifacts entanglement in politics. Now, my study case. My study case is the case of a delegation that happened in March 28th of 1949, just three days after the Greek national holiday that all of us Greeks love to celebrate with all due uh, honor to ceremony and pomp and parades and speeches and music and all that. This is not significant. And this, is not, and this is not insignificant. And this is not insignificant because that date marked the 128th anniversary from the onset of the Greek Revolution. This is a year of a bicentenary and we celebrate it with all due honor and respect. Uh, but in the post-World War II period, anniversaries like this carried special significance, mainly because the Greek nation was trying to resuscitate itself from the ashes, not only of World War II, but also from Second World War. The same date was also the second anniversary from the proclamation of the Truman Doctrine. I presume that you're all familiar with the Truman Doctrine, which determined the fates of Greece in the post-World War period, in some ways, all the way to today. And finally, in Greece, this is now forgotten, but this week was very significant because it, it coincided with a well-planned uh, week-long public celebrations in Greece under the title Work and Victory, Ergasia ke Niki. Now, the Greeks had many reasons for arriving to Washington, D.C. One of the primary reasons they wanted it was that they wanted to express the thanks of the Greek nation, or so the rhetoric, the public rhetoric in the press, et cetera, et cetera, went, mainly because two years earlier, President Truman had unveiled the Truman Doctrine. Uh, the major aim of which was to support, as he put it, I quote, to support free peoples resisting attempted subjugation by armed minorities or by outside pressures, end of quote. Essentially what was happening in the post-World War period was a very bloody, 
a devastating, destructive, physically and morally, civil war. And the Truman Doctrine aimed at helping countries that faced similar situations, including Greece, to face against civil wars, that the aim of which was essentially to establish Soviet type regimes in these countries. So the political leadership of Greece, those who, who wielded power in this period, uh, had lots of reasons to feel a special type of gratitude to Truman, but also to his administration and the United States in general uh, for their role in helping resurrect Greece economically, but also fend off the communist insurrection. It was very, very dangerous. Um, in my archival uh, research in various uh, archives here in the United States, especially in presidential libraries and museums, I came across documents uh, from um, Greek organizations like the Justice for Greece Committee, who lobbied very aggressively in order to promote the anti-communist cause. And here I present a quotation that, that um, shows uh, precisely the spirit of um, what was at stake in this confrontation. Essentially, Greece was uh, a foundational symbolic corner store of the West and, and liberal values of the West. So Greece had to be saved from the communist insurrection and the impending danger of a communist regime in Greece. And the conclusion here is a present Valayan fight, we have to understand against the communists, involves the future security of the whole democratic world, just as her victorious fight against the Persians did in 490 BCE. So the present situation is framed against uh, the stakes of a, a worldwide uh, uh, important uh, victory of the Greeks against the Persians in 490 BCE. The delegation was masterfully organized and uh, orchestrated and received wide uh, coverage in the press of the time, also the Greek American press. But I show here a photographic snapshot that was published on March 29th in the New York Times. Uh, what did the Greeks bring to President Truman? They brought a fine quality black figure Lithos attributed to the Athena painter. So it's not just one black figure Lithos, but a Lithos conceived um, archaeological terms also as a work of art, a work of art, excuse me, that shows two hoplites, two warriors fighting each other. They also brought this neck amphora, uh, which dates to about um, the second half of the eighth century BC. This was brought to Sam Rayburn, the speaker of the house. And it was part of the same series of gestures to the president and the political leadership of the United States. Now, you can't imagine my surprise when during my research, I discovered that these ancient pots carried inside them soil from battlefields at Konica, Carpenisi, and Florina, in which the Greek army of the time uh, defeated decisively the, their communist foes, the guerrillas of the uh, communist insurrection. This was very, very significant to bring Greek earth, Greek 
soil. We Greeks feel that the soil of our land, blood stained as it is, is sacred. So the sacred becomes a gesture that honors the recipients, in this case, President Truman and the Speaker of the House, Sam Rayburn, who incidentally had been instrumental in promoting through Congress the, the um, um, Truman uh, Doctrine and Financial Aid to Greece. I was able during my archival research in Greece a few years ago to find the, the provenance of this um, objects. This was a lucky moment. I did not expect it, but I insisted in looking through tons, thousands of pages of, of, of bureaucratic um, archives and, and documents. And I found this, prominent, this provenance, but unfortunately I don't have time here to go into details, perhaps in another lecture in the future. Most significantly, the Greeks the Greek delegation of 1949 brought to President Truman an architectural slab from the Temple of Athena Nikki, of the, from the Temple of Athena Victory on the Acropolis of Athens, um, dating, of course, to the fifth century BC. And this slab was uh, inscribed with a, a sort of stoichidon inscription that took the form of a proxenic decree. What is a proxenic decree in classical Greece? It is a decree of the demos, which confers the very highly, very honorary title of proxenos, consul, we would say nowadays, to a foreign dignitary. So Tremon, in other words, according to this decree, was declared an honorary Greek, a proxenos of the Greeks. This was the highest honor that could be conveyed to a US president. And I, again, I don't have time to go um, into the details. Uh, I was very surprised to find this document mainly because Greece has traditionally be, been very, very sensitive about anything that has to do with the Acropolis and has been exported from the country, like the Elgin marbles, for example. Uh, I know who composed the decree. There was a professor at the University of Athens. Um, I know that uh, the delegation before the before its departure, received uh, all sorts of attention in the press. There was even a temporary exhibit at the Zapion Megaron of all the items that the Greeks brought to President Truman. It was a big deal for them. They brought a carpet, a hand-woven carpet um, manufactured by orphan girls in the Alexander the Great Orphanage of, for Girls in Salonika. And I would need only a lecture to focus on how this document has been construed to weave together, no pun intended, various threads of symbolism. You see in the middle, the head of Alexander the, the Great in profile, it's a numismatic type against a, an architectural setting that is very reminiscent of um, the Lincoln Memorial. But again, I don't have time to go into details, but you get the sense of how, how well prepared, orchestrated, conceptualized was this delegation because it was meant to carry a very strong me uh, message to uh, the United States president, but also as it emerges from archival documents, the major recipients of these messages, of these gestures were also the Greek American community. Greece in the wake of the end of the civil war was desperate for foreign investment, especially the support of the wealthy and successful members of the Greek American community uh, here in the United States.
we talked earlier about um, gift exchange, diplomatic gift exchange on uh, the level of uh, spouses of um, presidents or high standing dignitaries. Uh, the delegation of 1949 brought an Amalia costume, hand embroidered, handmade in the best, the finest quality of silk for Mrs. Truman. I saw this dress myself, it is a piece of art, the best of the best, is wonderfully preserved, uh, but uh, unfortunately it's not on display at, um, the, uh, at Truman's um, uh, presidential library in, in, in independent uh, Missouri, just uh, a hope skip and a jump on the eastern outskirts of Kansas City. There was another ancient artifact, another Likithos, or this one of the white brown type that arrived in Washington DC during this delegation. Again, this Likithos, as the other two vases, was filled with dirt from battlefields in which Greek forces, the Greek army, had waged significant victories against the communist foes. Finally, the Greeks brought to President Truman a photographic album documenting the ideological rehabilitation of ex-communists on the Greek island of Macronisus. I have not been able so far to find this document. I don't know what happened to it. It's not in the Truman Presidential Archive. Uh, it's not in the Smithsonian Institution. I have my suspicion or where it might be, but uh, should it be discovered, it would be a major document of the history of the period. Essentially, the Greeks wanted to send the message, especially for Truman and the Congress that look, you have given us all this financial assistance and we do the job you expect from us to do. We are being victorious against the communists and not only are we being victorious, but we are reforming them ideologically. This was important. This was uh, conceived as a major target because Greece had to side with the liberal West in which nationalism was a paramount value, mainly because the foe, the, main, the major foe on the other side of the Iron Curtain, the, the communist ideology suppressed anything that had to do with ethnic values and nationalism in order to promote the uh, universal um, uh, communist ideology. After the presentation, the Greeks, you hear the very proud Epsones and the ladies uh, dressed in traditional uh, Greek costumes. They made their way to the Lincoln Memorial and they were photographed while uh, they are shown reading the Gettysburg address. Again, the overtones of this are very, very clear and I don't need to uh, comment on them at length. And here is another capture from a photographic album uh, that I was able to examine at the uh, library, the, the rare books division of the library of the Greek parliament. The great surprise here was that this album had been compiled by the then 20th century Fox CEO, Spiros Skouras, who was fundamentally instrumental in the um, organization and support of this delegation. My working hypothesis right now is that Spiros Kouras uh, was perhaps the one who came up with the idea of uh, uh, antiquities as diplomatic gifts in the uh, post-World War II period. And, um, uh, but, but I have not found the, the documentary evidence to, to elaborate that. I, I need to, to plunge into his archive, which is now um, uh, stored at the Stanford University in California. I also have to do significant work in Washington DC. So I look forward one day to be able to meet all of you 
uh, in person and update you on the um, results of my ongoing research on this topic. To conclude, the Greeks loaded antiquities with multiple layers of significance, political primarily, but also cultural and ideological. And the antiquities turn out to have been very, very carefully chosen because this black figure Lykithos, for example, is a funerary monument, is a monument that in antiquity was used in funeral ceremonies and Greece had all sorts of reasons to be in a, in a mournful state, especially in a, in a period of, of remembrance of um, wars and revolutions in which Greece lost their blood. But when you see two fighters fighting heroically against each other, the, the theme of victory emerges and the Greeks came to celebrate victory against uh, communist guerrillas. So the object is not innocent. It inscribes ulterior motivation. It describes a very, very important message for the Greeks. And if I had time, I would support precisely, I would argue precisely for the same for the other objects, so rich and so carefully chosen. They are tokens of a dimension of antiquities that has not received enough attention so far in scholarship. We usually think of antiquities as, as, as glorifying remnants of a glorious past, but antiquities exist to this day and they function in very, very interesting, sometimes surprisingly interesting ways. Thank you so much for your attention. I look forward to discussion. Thank you very much, Professor Papalexandru. Thank you for this very, very stimulating presentation. Thank you, Zui very wide breadth and depth of it. Um, we'll give a I, moment, I, yes. I, I leave, uh, I don't stop sharing mainly because um, members of our audience may have questions on what I presented and it would be easier for me to comment uh, while the PowerPoint is still on. Yes, very well, very well. Thank you, yes. So again, uh, uh, please um, uh, do type your questions or comments in, in the chat um, or raise your hand if you like any help with that. Um, and uh, we can uh, continue. We have about 10 minutes um, available to us uh, for a few, uh, for, for a bit more conversation. Um, so, um, and, and, and while we wait, and I, I will keep track a little bit of, of, of hands perhaps here um, and signals, um, maybe I just, um, maybe I'll start with just a question of mine. It's, it's a, so much to, to process and, and, and embrace in, in some ways, but um, so, I would just like to stay with the symbolism of, of like some of these gifts and the lekithoi at the moment. It just this is perhaps it was the last images we saw too, and the fact that they were filled with Greek soil of important moment, parts of the you know and, and moments in history and moments of struggle and so much so much symbolism. So um, as the gift is conveyed, um, how? how is that meaning kind of conveyed to the actor, you know, like, because there is this sort of almost ritual teleturgical uh, aspect of these presentations with a lot of meaning. So I guess it's like, how is, how would you see like the meaning understood between this, among these heads of states and perhaps how did that resonate in the public? Was this cl clearly public coverage? Um, so how do you think that worked? During the presentation, uh, and I go here, you see that um, the president is handling, and this is very important, the president has to have a tactile relationship 
with what he receives. He has to give his attention even for a fleeting moment. But um, I have found plenty of evidence, archival evidence, uh, of uh, mainly documents through which the State Department of Greece communicates to the State Department in the US the significance of the objects. Uh, so the object, the, one presumes that the president would have been briefed ahead of the presentation as to why the Greeks presented what they presented, but also the delegation uh, was um, led by a member of the Greek pal parliament, um, the uh, MP uh, Christos Zalokostas and his wife, Ellie. And Christos Zalokostas uh, in some way performed and explained to the president what the significance of the gifts was in detail. The same kind of information had been circulated in newspapers in Greece, but also in the United States. So the public at large was informed about um, what the significance was. Just in the moment of the presentation, which was very nicely staged, very theatrical, everything was inflated. Everything was uh, loud and, and pompous and rhetorically embellished. Thank you. Yep. We have a couple of questions, a few questions here. Um, and, and actually, I will combine um, uh, two questions from uh, Ms. Portu Palas. Do Greek governments continue to give antiquities as gifts to this day, especially in light of the sensitivity of our cultural property? Do we know what kinds of gifts have been given in the last 10 years? That's a very good question. Um, I'm, I'm concerned I always have an eye on what types of objects the Greeks bring. Because of the sensitivity uh, about uh, illegal um, um, export of antiquities from Greece, uh, the practice seems to have switched to replicas, very expensive and uh, sometimes specially commissioned replicas. For example, silverware um, um, manufactured by Zolotas, by, by um, the, the jewelry, the very expensive jewelry uh, Zolotas in Greece. Um, sometimes the replicas are the type of replicas um, in plastic, for example, especially when it comes to culture, to sculpture, manufactured by uh, special uh, worships. Um, for example, in the National Museum, they, they, they have a workshop for um, plaster casts, ekmagia, and they bring these types of objects, mainly because they are very fancy, even, in, even uh, despite the fact that they are replicas. Um, books are brought very often, textiles, that promote a type of production that uh, happens uh, in Greece, but not antiquities. There is sensitivity about antiquities. Uh, and to be honest, I need to, to go back and see what happens in the last five um, years. I would be very, very surprised if an antique object made it uh, to the US or a, a, another destination, for example, in um, Europe. Um, the, the, the focus is now antiquity, but, but objects inspired of antiquity, not objects deriving from antiquity. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Mr. Ethan Manuel. Were the gifts to Truman, especially the soil, but also the marble from the temple of Athena Niki, a special case owing to the Truman doctrine or did subsequent presidents receive similar gifts? Thank you. That's, that's a very important question. I believe that this is a special case, mainly because um, Greece had to um, express its thanks for uh, its share of the Marshall Plan. 
uh, gift exchange has always, this is an anthropological law, gift exchange has to be characterized by reciprocity. Uh, it marks uh, symmetrical relations. This goes all the way back to Homer, by the way. Greek heroes fight with each other at the, or they try to outdo each other in lavishness, in donating. It's, it's a war. And you know, we are Greeks. If we receive a present, we don't give the type the same type. We try to outdo the gesture to show how, how um, generous we are and how grateful we are. So this was a very, very particular case. Now, Greece was wrecked in the wake of the Civil War and World War II in the late 40s. There is nothing of actual value to bring to the United States. How do you help a superpower, the superpower of the world, the victor of the Second World War? How do you, how, how, what, what type of gesture is sufficient to, to, to express what the Greeks of the time, the political leadership felt that they had to do in order to, to, to engage in this uh, commensurate reciprocity. The cultural value of antiquity, its, its ideological significance, Greece was back then much more so, unfortunately, than it is now, the ideological cornerstone of the West. And the selection of these Greeks and these gestures that um, speak eloquently about the ties of modern Greece to ancient Greece, um, express this. That is, you gave us hundreds of millions of dollars and what we give back is this cultural value, which is still the major symbolic capital of Greece, because no matter uh, how much wealth we receive from Europe, we are a small, poor corner of, uh, of, of Europe, of the Mediterranean. We have a wonderful land, rich nature, incomparable antiquities, but we don't have natural resources like Germany has or France. So antiquities are the commensurate thanksgiving gesture that expresses this, res this reciprocity in a symmetrical fashion. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, this has been just a wonderful uh, um, journey. It was so so enriching and and um, also stimulating, uh, Professor of Alexandru. Um, really? I see. Just bear with me one moment. I see somebody coming in and out. Good. Um, I think we're coming at the. We we came to the end of our hour uh, today, and 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 would very much like to thank you. Thank you for your for. For these amazing offers of this um, very very stimulating, and uh, um, we hope that um, you, on behalf of all of us here listening to you, we hope that you you continue on your research you. and, um, um, and 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 as things can unfold, and that you continue to share with us um, findings and important thoughts. Uh, that, that are uh, of significance to all. Uh, Thank you. I, I hope in the future I will, I will have much more to report and more in depth <laughs> uh, as we, my, my uh, research continues. And because I have to come to the US, uh, I have to, to, to complete my archival research, especially in the National Archives and the Smithsonian um, institution and the Library of Congress that I may have the opportunity to, to, to meet you all in, in person. That would be a great pleasure, of course. Yes, it is a very good sign that, you know, you find so uh, the, the resources, you know, of Washington so important and through the, through, through the range of your career so far and continue to be very valuable. So we hope to see you here in person before long. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. Me too.
Yes, with this, un unfortunately, relentless time, we will need to close tonight's event. Um, again, with a very, very big thank you um, and gratitude for all you offer us. I'm just seeing a few questions popping in now. The, oh, let me see, or messages, okay. Perhaps uh, I like the idea of a, a few, let me just see here, let me catch up. Uh, this is a, a very, do you want to give this one a try because we are, we reached the close of our hour, but there is a question here from Gretchen. Yep. Says, Who was the owner of the gifts and where were, where, and where were the, these objects before they were brought to the United States? Um, yes. Um, ownership of antiquities in Greece is always with the state. The state is the owner of these antiquities. Now, as I mentioned before, the, the three uh, vases President Truman received uh, derive from, um, derive from um, the collection of duplicates in the National Archaeological Museum. I was able to determine that these were not excavated objects, that they uh, originate in confiscations of illegally excavated antiquities. Uh, the, in Greece, there has always been um, a distinction uh, between genuine antiquities, which have archaeological value, archaeological, archaeological informational value, and antiquities that do not have context, their provenience cannot be determined because of the circumstances of their discovery, uh, which are only uh, considered as works of art, as aesthetic works. Now, Greek museums uh, privilege the presentation of excavated works, excavated with the expenses and the sweat and the efforts of the very proud and very, very diligent Greek archaeological service. So they, many museums create uh, collections of duplicates and most um, important is the collection of duplicates at the National Archaeological Museum. So in this particular case, they've, they retrieved this basis, very high quality basis uh, from this collection. Uh, now, in certain cases, my archival research uh, produced evidence that what was in the collection of duplicates was not sufficient in quality or value, and they had to go to the art market. When Queen Elizabeth II got married to Prince Philip in 19, uh, I believe it was 1948, 1947, uh, Greece, who had special ties, uh, ties with Philip, had to engage in a significant um, gesture. The, the archaeological museum had not been constituted again, so they had not access to lots of antiquities. So what they did, they had to go to, a, to, a, to the art market, to an art dealer, uh, and they bought a red figure um, hydria, very high quality, representing a representation of a very graceful flying eros. And this is what they sent to Queen Elizabeth. I, 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 I know of this object, I have not seen it, but it's in Windsor right now. I've, been, I've had communication because I was trying to trace um, uh, provenance and provenience. And, and, and I was told of all this information by the curator of, of the Royal Collection in uh, Britain. And this was not an isolated incident. I, I cannot speak to when this practice stopped, but it was widespread. The Greeks, I mean, it sounds very, very paradoxical. The Greek state patronizing art dealers. What do art dealers do? They deal in illegal antiquities. Um, they, they had to resort to these issues because it was more important that Greece puts a nice face as a giving entity rather than engaging in a secondhand gesture. These things matter, of course. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. Um, 
Um, I know that I'm just on behalf of all of us uh, that, uh, that we're here today, um, we just um, uh, send our best wishes for good continuation in Thank your you. research, it. in your work. It's so valuable to us. It, it, it's, uh, it, it enriches us all. So, and thank you for sharing with us, uh, being so generous. This is uh, uh, immeasurable. So um, with you. this, we close our evening in the Zoom session, but let's, um, I, I look forward to staying in touch and, um, and, and, and um, learning about your progress. Very best wishes on your new book. I just cannot wait to, to receive it. Uh, um, and so, um, and, um, and, and, and we continue. Thank you all for joining us tonight. And we hope you, uh, we see each other again in um, a future event. Have a good evening to all. Kalini.